What's up everybody, Harley here. So I just learned about this attack and I'm super excited because if you've been watching my channel, you'll you'll notice that I really love Active Directory and I really love Active Directory based attacks. Just internal pen testing is, is always something that's been interesting to me. Um, so I just learned of a way for us to capture hashes and we're still gonna use Responder like we have in some of my previous tutorials, but this is a new method of getting uh, our clients or our victims to actually try to authenticate to us and, and send their hashes to us. So I think you're going to really enjoy this one and uh, let's just dive in and take a look. Okay, so let's try to set up the attack and understand what we're doing. So first off, I know there's a lot on the screen, there's a lot going on, I'll try my best to explain it. In the background, we're looking at a Kelly Linux box. This is gonna represent our attack machine. Here we've got one of the two domain join workstations that are a part of this nba.local domain. And then here we've got our actual domain controller, it acts as our file server, and there's no need to really log into that at the moment, so I'm not going to worry about it. But to start, let's just sign into our actual um, workstations, like a user would when they go to work, they'll log right in. And obviously here we're logging in as a K Irving user, and then here we're logging in as a K Bryant user. But what I want to show you is if we open up File Explorer, both of these machines, they have this network share um, already mapped. And when they click to it, we can see there's a handful of documents here. And this is very standard to see in most organizations. You'll have some sort of central file server and everyone kind of stores their documents so that way they can all work off the same documents. Maybe that file server gets backed up and, and whatever. So what are we doing? What's the attack? Where the goal of the attack is for us to pull down net NTLM hashes from these users. Now I've shown videos before where we did that through like LLM and R poisoning, but that requires that certain legacy protocols are enabled in the environment. So what if sysadmins, they created the necessary GPOs and made the registry modifications to try to secure the network and that attack isn't working? Well, we've got to find other ways to try to capture these hashes so we can either take them offline and try to crack the password or try to do some sort of relay attack to machines that have SMB signing disabled. If all of this sounds new to you, go check out some of my other Active Directory videos. I've got like three of them that just kind of talk about performing these type of attacks. But Okay, at this point, you've got an understanding of how a responder works and you know what a net NTLM hash is. Um, so what we're looking at here then is a way for us to capture new hashes. And the way that that's gonna work in this case is what happens if we were to make our own file? We can come in just say like new text document. And this icon right here, what if we had a way to control that icon? So that way, anytime someone browses to this share, it tries to load an icon that maybe doesn't exist, but at least points to a different location that the attacker controls, right? So what if we had this icon living on a remote file share that maybe belongs to the attacker computer that, that we control? Maybe then, just by browsing to a share, the, the victim would try to access this remote file share, which in turn could end up passing us a net NTLM hash. Well, that's what we're gonna talk about. That's the attack that we're gonna do. And this is awesome for attackers to use when they come across a public file share that they have right access to. So let's just start by doing the attack. So if we head over to a blog post, like usual, I try to make one for each one of these type of demonstrations, just so that way people can read through it, skim it, or copy and paste. Um, but this is our attack topology. We've got this 10.0.1.0 subnet, and all four of these machines are a part of it. These are the same machines that I just showed you. We've got the two workstations, the file server, and then that Kali Linux box. All three of these are a part of the same nba.local domain. Our attacker machine is not a part of the domain, but it can communicate to the same subnet. Okay, so this is all part of a local network. You may be able to still perform this type of attack if you don't have local network access, um, but there's a lot of factors that come into play. Like first, you would have to do port forwarding to be able to receive these SMB requests. 
there would also have to be no firewall filtering in place for when these machines go out of the network trying to authenticate over SMB. So like port 445 would need to be allowed outbound, which isn't typical to be seen in most organizations. Usually that's blocked. Um, but if you're on the same local network as, as the rest of the victim machines, then this will likely work for you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy the series of PowerShell commands. And since we're gonna use PowerShell to, to create our malicious link file, um, we actually are gonna need to run this from a Windows computer, right? So we'll copy all that down. And you don't have to run it from a computer that's a part of the same domain, but in this case, I'm going to. Um, so I guess in our simulation here, we'll just kind of pretend that we've compromised this machine. Um, and now that we've got access to it, we run these PowerShell commands. So before I run them, let's just throw it into a notepad and try to understand what's going on. So we see that we're creating a new object here and we're storing it into a variable called object shell. And then the rest of these commands are really just updating different items within that object. So we're gonna tell it to create a shortcut and give it a target path and just all of the other details that come into creating an object. Um, our name of the object is represented right here. So whatever we type here is going to be the path and the name of the file we end up creating. I'm gonna leave that as C malicious link. That works fine for my purposes. This placeholder needs to be replaced with your attacker IP. Now again, if you're using this from the same local network, you can just use your internal attacker IP address. Um, if you're trying to do it externally when you don't have local access to the network, there's factors that play in, but obviously you would give it your external IP. Um, in this case, from the attack machine, I'm gonna do a sudo if config, I believe on ethernet, ethernet zero. So my IP address is this 10.0.0.1.6. So I'll copy that down and then we'll head right back into I'll go ahead and load all these back up. Head right back into this guy, and we'll replace that with that. And so what this is gonna do, I'll copy all this out, we'll run that in PowerShell, and we'll let that chew on it for a second. But what should happen is it should end up coming into our C drive and creating a malicious.link file right there. Looks like it is in the process of it at the moment. So we got all that done, here's our malicious link file. And if we go into the properties of it, we can see all the details, right? So it's got this target of 10.0.1.6 and it's got the description or the comment that we left. Perfect, it's got, it's got all the details filled out. So what I'm gonna actually do is I'm gonna rename this file and I'm just gonna give it an, an at symbol because what that will allow it to do when you use special characters like this, it's gonna typically throw it to the top of the file share. So when we go and copy this and we paste it into the share directory, we want it to show up at the top. So that way any user who browses to it is gonna have a higher likelihood of coming across it. And then that icon's gonna attempt to load, which should make a call out request to our responder running on our attack machine and allow us to capture the hash. And maybe we also wanna give this, you know, a less conspicuous name, uh, like totally safe file. <laughs> Obviously, if you're in a pen test, right, um, you, you'd wanna check and make sure it's okay for you to write files. This is also a pretty noisy thing. Like, it's, it's gonna be pretty easy to come across and detect this file because it's gonna stand out, right? It doesn't look like a real file, and if you give it a name like this, it's obviously gonna be raising some red flags. And if anyone were to go and observe the details of it, they would see the IP address of your attack machine pretty quickly. So. This is definitely something that, you know, OPSEC safe, if you're on a red team engagement, you may or may not want to do this. Um, but this, th for, for what we're showing here, I think it'll work in most regular internal network assessments. So we'll copy this out and all that's left is to paste it into that remote file share. Right, and because we have write access, there it is. And if we refresh this page, we can see because it has that at symbol in the beginning, it's gonna go all the way to the top. So that's, that's everything set up. So at this point, let's head into our responder directory and we'll just run responder.py with ethernet zero as my listening interface. And I'm gonna press enter. So now we're just simply waiting for someone to browse to that remote file and we can help push it along, right? Let's go to our victim machine and I haven't refreshed the page here. We can see the file showed up, but what happens if I come in and I just refresh? I go to this file share again. Check that out. Immediately, 
the user that we're logged into, we can open up a quick PowerShell instance and I can just run a who am I. We can see where this K Bryant user who accessed this file share, we didn't click on the file, we didn't open it, we just simply browsed to the file share and Responder was able to issue a challenge that captured the Intel MV2 hash. So now we could take this hash offline, we could throw it in the hash cat, we could try to crack it, um, or you know, we could just relay it to a machine that has SMB signing disabled. So, so yeah, obviously this attack is extremely powerful, um, which, which raises the question, how do we protect against this, right? How do we mitigate this and make it to where this doesn't happen to us? Um, now, what I showed you here in this case, it was all local, right? And I've kind of talked about it already, uh, but if you don't have egress firewall rules that are blocking SMB outbound, if you're allowing 445 uh, or for your workstations to make connections over port 445 outside of your network, this is really, really, really bad, right? Because Imagine someone was able to drop that and now from outside the network, maybe they don't have an internal presence, um, but from outside the network, they can capture these type of hashes. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. So making sure you've got some egress firewall rules in place to block these two ports from outbound connections is going to be important. And in some ways, you know, if, if you even wanted to try to restrict, you know, workstation to workstation ab ability to communicate outbound to port 445, that might be something you want to consider. Now, if you've got a lot of file shares that are on your workstations and other users around the network need to access them, then obviously blocking 445 is going to give you some trouble. Um, but you want to take a look at your environment and consider, is this file share necessary? And that leads us to the next piece here. If you do determine that a file share is necessary, you need to be strict about the permissions that you apply, right? Because if, if the attacker didn't have right access to that central file share, they wouldn't have been able to drop that file to begin with. So making sure that you don't allow anybody and everybody to write to places that are really, really high traffic is going to be a really key element to try to mitigate this issue. And that's going to help you with other attacks too, right? Because if, let's say, you have a ransomware outbreak, if there's shares that are writable, that ransomware is going to be able to communicate to those shares and overwrite them and encrypt them. And so you're going to want to leave strict file permissions anywhere that you can. Um, now again, this isn't going to be foolproof, right? Because let's say you only allow your accounting department to access the accounting and write files in the accounting share. Well, what if someone in the accounting department was compromised and the attacker used their account to create this file, right? So you've got to think through it all. The least amount of write privileges you can assign, the better. And then now at this point, let's assume that the file's there. Let's assume that it's on the share and it's being actively exploited. These two next pieces are gonna help you kind of mitigate the impact of this. So if you enforce SMB signing, what that's gonna do is it's gonna take it to where, yeah, we've captured this hash, but I can't just relay it to another machine to authenticate. So I can't pass the hash. That's not the right term. Technically, it's a relay. Um, but we can't take that and send it to a computer without cracking it first to be able to authenticate as that user. So enforcing SMB signing is definitely something that you're going to want to consider for your environment. In most cases with modern computers, you can do that with very little impact. Um, if, you're, if you've got some older computers, they may not be able to handle the additional load that the CPU takes by doing that that's additional signing. It takes some additional encryption. Um, so you may or may not be able to, to implement that, but it's something you definitely need to consider. Um, and in most cases, the impact is pretty low. And then after that, of course, I mean, you hear this all the time, but implementing a strong password policy is always going to help you. Because think about this. If SMB signing is enforced across your entire network, the only thing we can do with this captured hash at that point is try to take it offline and try to crack it, right? But if it's a 15 character random string, there's no way that we're gonna crack that in a reasonable amount of time in most cases. So if you have a strong password policy and SMB signing is required across the domain, we, yeah, we capture the hash, but what are we gonna do with it, right? We can't do anything. So these are ways you can try to mitigate these attacks or I guess mitigate once the attack has been performed. Um, and I hope you learned something. Yeah, this was a lot of fun to make a video on. I know I'm definitely gonna be using this on all of my internal assessments that I'm doing in the future. I thought it was really exciting, so I wanted to share it with you. 
If this is the type of content that you like, please let me know. Leave a like on the video. Consider subscribing if you're new here. And uh, yeah, I'll just catch you guys in the next one.